Hey, all Scott here. Here's how to support the show. First of all, buy my book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. The audiobook is now available. If you like this show, you'll love the audiobook, I guess, or something. Uh, sign up at patreon.com. You want to incentivize me to do more interviews all the time? Sign up at patreon.com, and through the magic of multiplication tables, uh, I'll make a living doing anti-government propaganda for you here. Uh, sign up for my YouTube channel. It happened, finally. We're living in the future now where it's a done thing. All 4,600 and something interviews are up at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Thank you for your decade worth of patience on that issue. Um, and hey, sign up for the RSS feeds at scotthorton.org or at Libertarian Institute. we got a lot of other great podcasts there at the Libertarian Institute as well. Uh, so check all that out. And then uh, find out all about how to donate to the show at scotthorton.org slash donate. For your PayPal uh, kind of one-off donations, uh, for 20 bucks, you can get the audio book for 50 bucks, I'll send you a signed copy of the paperback of Fool's Errand. Uh, for a $100 donation to the show, you get a silver QR code commodity disc. It's the coolest kind of currency I've ever heard of. And uh, anyone who donates, and this is just for this month only for what's left of it, anyone who donates $100 or more to The Scott Horton Show gets a lifetime subscription to Listen and Think Libertarian Audiobooks. Find out all about that at scotthorton.org. And yes, I accept uh, Zen Cash and Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and uh, Litecoins and all those different kinds of digital currencies there as well. If uh, you hate holding on to those digital currencies and you want to get rid of them all, send them to me. Um, and hey, if you read the book and you liked it, or you listened to the audiobook and you liked it, uh, or if you like the show, give me a good review on Amazon, on Audible, on uh, iTunes and Stitcher and those kinds of things. Because, I don't know, somebody said that helps or something. Thanks. Sorry, I'm late. Oh. I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda. Zawahiri is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? It's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. But we ain't killing they army, but we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben. Say it. Say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys. Introducing Peter Van Buren, former State Department official. He wrote, we meant well about his time in Iraq War II. And, um, of course, he wrote The Ghost of Tom Joad, and then most recently, Hooper's War, a novel of World War II Japan, although really it's about our day and time as well. Uh, we Meant Well is the name of his blog, and we run a lot of what he writes at antiwar.com as well. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing? It's a pleasure to be here, Scott, and thank you for reprinting a lot of my stuff. Um, it's important to, to, to get messages out and to expose people to diverse points of view, and that is getting harder and harder and harder. Uh, more and more of the mainstream places that I, I used to write for regularly are imposing requirements that, that just make it very hard to, to get a second line of thought out there. Uh, whether you agree or disagree is beyond it. It's simply getting the ability to put these ideas in front of people. And so good for you and good for antiwar.com. Well, it's funny that you say that because actually you have the distinction here, the dubious honor of um, recording with me the only interview I've ever really spiked just because it was obsolete by the time anyone was going to hear the damn thing. And so... Um, it was not really a big deal, but I just figured it probably wasn't worth passing along because it was all about, geez, do you think Trump is going to bomb these guys? And then later he did bomb them. Uh, last yeah, you Friday know, I, night. Thought, I thought 
I, I kind of was wondering about you, you not uh, not running that interview. I mean, it, it, for the listeners. I yeah, mean, that, we, we that was why. I guess I wasn't clear, but I was trying to go ahead and get you on again the next day and just do. Yeah, you know, no, you want to redo I it, and then you couldn't because you had things. No, I could. I couldn't make it. I had to wash my hair that day. Oh man, but the, see? Uh, no, no, the uh, we did an interview uh, for for the listeners. I mean, there's no great uh, con- no conspiracy theories here, folks. Um, uh, basically, Putin called Scott and told him to to throw the interview away, or the Russian bots would be released. Um, no, uh, Scott and I did an interview, and we were speculating on what Trump would do in Syria. I, I kind of, I was kind of wondering if you might run the interview, you know, with a little editorial comment about saying, you know, 24 hours earlier, this is what the picture looked like, and now here's what's happened. I, I, it might have been kind of amusing in the sense to kind of play our, our predictions off against what actually happened. But nonetheless, now that it's happened, we can be correct and accurate and, and sound even more intelligent uh, things. And, and Vladimir, thanks for the flowers and, and the fruit basket. All right, so we'll talk about Syria in just one second. But tell me some more about these restrictions. It, I just guess that you're talking about the Post and the Times. I know you've published I, I in major wanna, papers here. I don't want to talk about any particular place because I still want to find ways to, 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 to reach okay, a larger well, tell audience. Tell us in general about these new but restrictions I, that you're I – think, I think there is a, a concern uh, in a couple of ways. One, I, I think that – these media sources are becoming far too sensitive to, to social media. I think they worry a lot about how they're going to be perceived. And that leads into their own, in many cases, ideological territories where, where the, the individuals you're working with are, are, are fearful of Donald Trump. Um, there's a difference between opposing his policies and, and being terrified of, of him. In, in a larger sense. And there's a difference between being terrified that he might make the wrong decision on topic X versus being terrified that he represents the end of the republic, the end of democracy. Um, there's a piece, for example, in, in Salon today where, where some author uh, calls Trump a traitor and says that our, our individual liberties are, are gone that uh, if the most the election in 20 in November is the most important election in American history because it decides the future of the country. Okay, what happens is that when concerns about an editorial position, I'm arguing that decision A is good versus decision B, when that bleeds past saying, well, we don't agree with the decision into what you're writing might be near treasonous or it might in some way help the forces of, of, of evil. And I'm, I'm exaggerating only slightly here in these discussions. And so we don't really want to run an article, for example, saying that Trump and Kim Jong-un are not madmen who are walking us to the brink, um, which was a specific example back in, as you, as you know, I have long maintained that the United States and, and Korea, the Koreas are not going to war. And uh, back in November, when all the uh, Trump was tweeting about fire and fury. Uh, I wrote a, a piece for a, a, a major mainstream publication that said, slow down. These are not madmen. There's nothing in their historical record that suggests they make impetuous decisions, never mind impetuous decisions on, on the level of, of, of total nuclear war. So back down a step. Um, the rhetoric is, is is nasty and it's, it's bellicose, but I don't think you need to bury gold in your backyard at this stage. And they basically said, look, we can't run an article saying Trump is not a madman at this point, um, given what's happening on social media, both the things Trump was tweeting and and the things that their readers were tweeting, um, worrying about whether they were going to live through the, the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, yeah. Quite literally, people believing that. and Which is, of it, course, the most important reason to run an article like that. Hey, look, I'm a State Department guy. I used to be over there. I know a thing about this. And yep. a little context, a little bit of wisdom here, huh? And no, no time for that. In the, uh, the, the conclusion of the article was basically, look, the only thing different between what's happening now and, what ha- and for the last 70 years of non-nuclear war is, is is some tweets. Subtract out the tweets, and what do you have? You have the status quo, and that should answer the question. But in fact, I think that in many cases, these mainstream media people who who live on on Twitter and 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 and, and are hyper sensitive to these things, um, have had their judgment 
really kind of screwed up. And I know we'll talk later about Korea and what's going on over there, but I think we're seeing perfect, perfect examples of this where there is simply no narrative in, in the mainstream media that suggests anything other than disaster, trickery, um, and all sorts of negatives. There's simply are, are people's logic centers shut down by their literal fear yeah. of, of Donald Trump. Well, yeah, it's such an ironic thing, you know, because, of course, he's incredibly dangerous, this guy who used to never be dangerous before until somebody gave him the presidency. And <laughs> now, uh, you know, you have the state itself concerned because usually we get to pick between a Bush and a Kerry, something like that. And somehow, mostly because of the Democrats being too clever by half and trapping themselves into this, um, they wanted to have Donald Trump. They figured he'd be the easiest one to beat, and they severely misjudged that. They thought Hillary would be the one to beat him, and they certainly misjudged that. And so, you know, I don't know, man. I can't find I, – I think I agree with you on that status quo, I think, describes his policy on almost everything. Yes. Right. And yet he is not a governor, a senator, a bonesman or a one of these guys. And so they're just absolutely terrified of him. Um, seemingly, I think they're afraid that he'll do the right thing, like force the Israelis to stop colonizing the West Bank or pull the troops out of Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan, this kind of thing, which I don't think are legitimate, quote, fears on their part at all. I mean, no. I'd like to be that hopeful, but come on. And once again, I, I, I go back to the, the same point that, that we've made so many times, but it bears repeating. And that is, let's simply look at what's really been done. Shut Twitter off. Set that aside for a moment. Um, call it an intellectual experiment if that makes you feel better. And, and take a look. Um, Trump's been in office now for a year and, uh, what, five months, something like that. Um, we haven't started any new wars. We have seen some ratcheting down in Iraq on American military presence there. Um, but we've seen basically the status quo. All of the things we were told to fear have just simply not not happened. And at some point, there's going to be the, the, the scales have to acknowledge that as each day goes by and, and we don't have a new war and we haven't had, uh, you know, roundups of, of this or that or the end of, of this or that. Um, Trump is still far, far behind Obama in, in terms of actual numbers of deportations, for example. You know, at some point, the weight of evidence simply has to come into play, I hope, um, though I don't know it ever, it, it ever will in the environment that, that we live in. But that's, that's the world that I try to stay in. Well, and it really I, undermines this whole confused narrative, really undermines our real effort to get him to stop fulfilling this status quo right like this the status quo is why the war party should remain calm everything's fine they don't need to do a coup here or anything but for the yeah. rest of us we don't want permanent war in eight countries or nine or i lost track you know yeah it, it's it's any number you want because for everyone you know about there there's something else going on that that we haven't heard about yet but i i like to pivot to the example of korea which, which i i think is is a is a good one if you simply shut off your because Trump filter for a moment and say, let's take a look at what's going on there. The, nucle the, the nuclear testing and the missile testing, which supposedly walked us to the brink of war uh, months ago, ha has stopped. And Kim Jong-un has said he has uh, no need to continue that testing. It's very easy to simply say, well, he he's lying. OK, fine. I, I can't argue with you if you're simply going to say he's lying. Um, because none of us predict the future, but we can do is look at what has happened and, and where we are today. So there's, he has, has self-imposed a moratorium on nuclear and, and missile testing. He has said that denuclearization as a concept is not non-negotiable. That is a massive change in, in policy on North Korea's part. He has said that the removal of U.S. troops from South Korea is not a precondition 
to any significant negotiation. That itself represents a, a huge change in, in things. He has He's meeting on Friday with uh, Moon Jae-in, the uh, South Korean president, to discuss the formal end of the Korean War. Largely a symbolic gesture, but it is a symbolic gesture of enormous power in South Korea. And this is, again, the Western media simply sees this as Trump versus Kim, you know, the cage match to the death. Um, the, the South Koreans are very much a part of, of all this, if not the driver of the train. 80% of people in South Korea spread across the political spectrum from left to right support a peace treaty to end the, the Korean War. For Moon Jae-in, that is a massive domestic victory. It essentially, barring any, any future events to the contrary, it assures his re-election. And Kim Jong-un is well aware of what he's handing him at that point. This is a, this is a present, um, a political present. And those kinds of developments are simply unheard of in the history of the Korean Peninsula. The idea of a summit meeting between North and South, which is taking place on Friday, and between the United States and North and South, which will take place supposedly sometime in, in early June, these are unprecedented developments. Simply, they do not exist in, in, in history. And to find to work as hard as it appears that places like the New York Times and the Washington Post have been working to try to find a downside to all this, it, it almost skips into into the into parody and, and, and satire. Um, it, it's simply amazing what is going on over there and the potential that exists for this process to lead to significant change on the Korean Peninsula for the very first time in, in, in history. Yeah, I mean, it really is incredible. It's um, it's one of those things happening right before your eyes. You're not quite sure what you're seeing. And, you know, the as you're saying, the, the big meeting with Trump has yet to take place here. But, I mean, come on. All this stuff about, oh, they're just faking it and, oh, they're just playing you and all of that. You know, it's like uh, Norman Podhoritz attacking Ronald Reagan for dealing with Gorbachev. It's so apparent to me that, like, you guys are just on the wrong side of this. You know, Jason Ditz has this article where, you know, sort of the sub-headline of the thing is where Reuters went desperately found, like, three South Koreans on the street somewhere out of God knows how many they interviewed, desperately looking for somebody skeptical so that they could say, well, you know, Mr. Whoever on the street wasn't quite buying it, just because that's how hard they're trying to... Well, and so what is the deal there? I mean, I know, obviously, the partisanship and the whole Trumpian Trump thing, but... Doesn't it seem strange, even for par, even for these guys, even for the Washington press corps and the these mm-hmm. major papers and TV stations, that they're just so adamant to be negative about this in every yep. way? It's really what's, funny to me, kind of. What's What's happened mirrors what I've encountered in in some editorial discussions with with some of those same people, um, and that they, their their logic center ha, has come off uh, come off balance they feel that trump is so far outside of the mainstream of how politics quote unquote works that they feel uncomfortable intellectually applying the same intellectual rigors to what trump is doing as they have for for previous presidents they simply refuse to accept the possibility that he, he meaning him and his entire uh, policy establishment, right down to the, the lowest State Department cuckoos who's typing memos, you know, he and his policy establishment are capable of a complex multilateral negotiation process. They, they simply can't accept that that is even within the realm of possibility. And so they allow themselves to, to kind of slide off the edge of the table and into these weird speculative fantasies about what really must be going on. This is some kind of elaborate trick on Kim Jong-un's part, or that it's, it's you know, they're going to lure Trump into the room where he's going to accidentally uh, sign away the land rights to Florida to the North Koreans before he realizes what's happened. Um, um, or these kind of you know overt sillinesses that, that that really are the only way that they can explain something without intellectually engaging with with what is really going on, um, and it's it's very very unfortunate and it's very disconcerting to me because they've applied the same set of of intellectual rules to every president forever, except now 
no one ever until the very last days uh, of the Nixon administration said this man is is mentally ill and therefore uh, everything he's doing has to be seen as the acts of a, of a deranged person. Um, Instead, it was a policy, oh, the madman policy that Nixon pursued in North Vietnam, where for, for those uh, who haven't uh, gotten that far in the, in the reading, I mean, this was Nixon tried uh, at one point to convince the North Vietnamese that he was capable of nuking them as a way of, of uh, tricking them into, into making concessions. No one said Nixon is truly deranged and is going to kill us all. They said, oh, what a clever policy, so Machiavellian, you know, he, he he's really knows what he's doing. Um, it's come under more criticism since. But at the time, I look back, for example, um, at the history of the United States opening up its relationship with, with, with China. And at no point... I, I, no, I'm really reading, glad you brought that up because I think, you know, a lot of people don't even know really about that at all. We, I hope everybody knows that Soviet communism in Russia and in Eastern Europe all dissolved at the end of the 1980s, the beginning of the 90s, right? 88 through 91, right, everybody? Yeah. But... When exactly did America's relationship with China change? I know they still fly that red flag. And it was a, it was a change that I think was a little less dramatic in, in, in the sense that there was no wall to fall down on TV. So it, didn't, uh, it wasn't as mediagenic. But, you know, you started with uh, Nixon's visit to China, which was the first sort of significant overt diplomatic move. And I don't remember the exact day. I think it was like 1972, maybe. Um, don't quote me on that. Somebody hit Wikipedia uh, while I'm stammering here. But it's in, it's in that zone. But the, the real breakthrough came in 1970. 79, when a Chinese leader, uh, the Chinese leader at the time, Deng Xiaoping, um, recognized, and we know this in, in retrospect from his diaries and things, we, he recognized that his country was needed to, 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 to change paths, that the centrally managed economy was failing. People were hungry. People were not getting the things they needed. He was spending a lot of money on, on defense with very, very little return, and he needed to make uh, some changes. In order to make those changes, he had to secure his, himself defensively. He could not continue a tension standoff with the United States over issues that, at the end of the day, really were not that important uh, in a grand global scheme. I mean, the idea of what, what is the official status of Taiwan, for example? Um, is it part of China? Is it not part of China? These, these were issues that were debated uh, you know, aggressively in, in the day. Um, and... He set out to work with uh, President Jimmy Carter, who, whose parentheses, whose reputation as a as a diplomat and as a statesman has not yet been fully uh, recovered uh, from some mistakes he made. Close parentheses. Um, and Deng worked out a set of agreements in 1979 that basically said that China was going to be a nuclear power, that we were going to find some language that made us all comfortable with these sticky little issues about. What, what is the status of Taiwan, um, and we're going to move ahead. And at that time, and I've been reading back as, as much as I can, I don't find anyone saying, but oh my God, we're, we're acknowledging China as a nuclear power or anything along those lines. China had been a nuclear power since 1960s. They were a nuclear power before the, the vast majority of, of our listeners today were even born. And Jimmy Carter correctly understood that he was not going to negotiate China's nuclear deterrent down to zero. And in fact, he had no reason to do that because it was, in fact, a, a nuclear deterrent. What he needed to do was find ways to bring China into the international system such that war was simply not something that they needed to consider. It was, it was not even a, very, a good business decision. And by making those agreements in 1979, he freed Deng up to begin to decentralize his economy, to spend more domestically and less on, on defense, to pull back from little foreign adventures in, in, in Vietnam and other places. Um, and the results of that are in front of us today. China is now a, a member of the international community. It's a significant trading partner. Um, the rest of the stuff is, is a lot of fluff that, that the conservatives need to keep uh, keep themselves busy writing editorials about the South China Seas and, and all that. There's no one seriously saying the United States and China are on the edge of nuclear war. And I think that is the model that Trump is going to stumble into 
in Korea, and I want to go back to that word stumbled into in a moment, um, is the model of China in the 19, late 1970s, where a lot of, of complicated issues were set aside in favor of what was really very important, which was modernizing China from their point of view and bringing them into the world community from the West's point of view, both of which basically did away with the possibility of, of any kind of conflict. Now, I want to circle back to that, I, that those words stumble into, because um, despite the way the Western media is portraying the upcoming uh, events in Korea, this is not Trump versus Kim in a cage match, you know, two men enter, one man leaves, uh, and things like that. It, it's not that case at all. The train is being driven by the Koreans, by the North Koreans and by the South Koreans. Donald Trump, in order to succeed in this summit, has to do very little more than stay off to the side. Um, Moon Jae-in, the South Korean president, has shown that he has no problem with Trump taking credit for anything Trump wants to claim credit for. Um, Moon is playing for much bigger stakes uh, than, than, than that. Um, Trump simply needs to stay out of the way so that the Koreas can work this this out between them and he can claim credit for it. And knock on wood, I, I think we've seen some signs that Trump understands that. The United States played a low key role in the um, initial steps at the Olympics uh, between the Koreas. When North and South Korea announced that they're looking to, to resolve the Korean War uh, uh, with a peace agreement, Trump said, it has my blessing. It was a crude, stupid way to th say things, but that's you're going to get that out of Trump, but it's basically his way of saying, you guys go ahead and, and, and do that. We'll, we'll stay over here and wait. Um, the thing that Trump couldn't negotiate away, the presence of U.S. troops, that would be too much for his conservative base. Kim has handed that to him and said, we're not going to worry about that. Um, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity where the needs of the North Koreans for economic reform are matching with the political needs of the South Korean government to have to find peace on the peninsula with an American presidency, for better or worse, that is finally willing to put aside their madmen, we can't negotiate with them rhetoric and allow someone else to do the heavy lifting. Um, I am frighteningly optimistic on this. And if I'm wrong, Scott, have me back on the show and, and, and just just whip the hell out of me. But I think we're on the verge of something historical here. I think they could even negotiate away the nukes. I mean, it's, it, it'd have to be a hell of a grand bargain. You know, a 100% security guarantee. None of this Bush Obama stab you in the yep. back, Muammar Gaddafi stuff. But, well, you yeah. know, outright ironclad. <laughs> like, I mean, Kennedy's, I guess they did covert stuff, but they lived up to Kennedy's promise not to invade Cuba after he promised right. not to invade Cuba. That's right. right? And they also, let's, let's not forget that one of the other ways that the Cuban Missile Crisis was resolved is Kennedy's secret agreement to remove U.S. nuclear missiles from Turkey, um, which was bugging the Russians. But, okay, but so how crazy am I if I say that if Trump went over there and said, look, we'll pull our troops out, we'll give you a security guarantee, we'll sign a peace treaty to end the war, we'll drop all sanctions, and we'll just be friends, and we'll just forget about that time we murdered three million of you guys, and you guys can forget about it too, and let's just be friends from now on after this, and but give up your missiles and your nukes. You think they'd go for it? No, that, that's not what's going to happen here, and we want to be careful about things like that and, and, the, and the term. Well, that's what I would do. <laughs> well... And, and for better or worse, Scott, you and I are stuck here. Uh, no, nobody's given me the call yet to, to pack up and, and be ready to go to, uh, to, to the negotiating table. But if I get the call, you're coming with me. I say um, send Dennis Rodman and his people. They could well, work the deal. My bags aren't going to carry themselves, son. So, look, the thing is this. The, 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 the media and, and the, the Washington Post is, is way out in front on this, is, is creating a straw man, which basically says it, it, in, that if Trump comes away from this summit meeting without having personally dismantled every nuclear weapon in North Korea, it's a failure and he's been played. That is garbage. That is that is totally ahistorical. That has nothing to do with how things work. Let's take a look at, for example, the Iranian nuclear accords, which, however imperfect, seem to be, we'll, 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 we'll just agree to agree that it, it was a step in the right direction. Those nuclear accords took two full years to negotiate and they did not involve actual nuclear weapons. If you look back at the negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, which did involve actual nuclear weapons, those negotiations went on 
sometimes for decades before they achieved even modest bits of progress. And so the idea of, of saying there's a one-shot nuclear nu denuclearization agreement that is even remotely possible is just ahistorical. Um, it's a straw man set up so that everybody can claim Trump ha has failed. Instead, what you're looking at here are steps that immediately reduce the danger of, of accidents, that reduce the forward progress on nuclear weapons. And we're seeing that already with some of these unilateral decisions Kim has made. And you're looking for a mechanism being created that will allow negotiations to continue to move forward, all the while, while Kim's arsenal becomes what, it, what many people believe it is, which is simply a deterrent. You don't hear anything about the Pakistani nuclear arsenal. You don't hear anything about the Indian nuclear arsenal. Well, listeners to this show do. But. Well, uh, and you don't hear much at all. I mean, the United States doesn't even agree. It admits the, the Israeli nuclear arsenal because those nuclear arsenals are in stasis. They are deterrents. They exist for a specific purpose in the case of, for example, Pakistan, to prevent the Indians from nuking them and vice versa. And that is what Kim's nuclear arsenal is and will eventually erode to through this process. Now, at some date in the, in the future, will the last nuclear weapon sort of just kind of fade away? I don't know, but it becomes irrelevant. It becomes like the Chinese nuclear arsenal, which the United States and China agreed was not going to be a, a, an issue in order to allow broader progress to occur. And that's what you're going to see here. And denuclearization uh, as a straw man is a very real danger here. Um, and I worry very, very much that the, the Democrats and the media will, will, will gang up on Trump and use that as a way to, to beat on him. Um, but that's not where the action is. The action is on, on the money here. And what you're going to watch for is outcomes that cause Kim, for example, and, and I'm, I'm following Deng Xiaoping's example here from 1979, word for word, that you'll see initial steps, for example, that tell farmers they keep the surplus they grow, that tell factories they can sell on the open market in North Korea pro, uh, pro, pro products they make in excess of, of their quotas, that you see the beginnings of South Korean commerce uh, in North Korea, not showpieces like the Kaesong factory. Uh, for those of you who, who are not familiar, there was a factory created uh, in a place called Kaesong, North Korea, which was basically a South Korean investment using North Korean slave labor to make uh, cheap products. And it became a political football more than, than anything else. But, but serious investment by business people who are interested in, in making business deals, not political deals, as, as was Kaesong. If, when you see those things happen, Contingent, continuing with a moratorium on nuclear testing, you're seeing something happen. You're seeing a process, not an event. The Western media is trying to turn this summit into an event when it is not. It never Summits are not that way. What they are are part of a process. And if you see the tools being created for this process to continue after Trump and Kim go home, then you are seeing history being made and you're seeing progress being done. Never mind the, the, the announcements that, that uh, Trump went home empty handed. Yeah. Well, you know, I read a thing that seems smart by some guy saying, you know, he's got fancy academic names for the different models of diplomacy and all this kind of crap, which I'm sure you're very familiar with and care a lot about. <laughs> but uh, yeah. he's saying, look, uh, this isn't the kind of negotiation like, uh, I forget what he's talking about, maybe arms control with the Soviet Union, like you're talking yeah. about piecemeal stuff over yeah. decades and stuff. Uh, this is more like Nixon goes to China and shakes hands with Mao and smiles for the cameras, and now the ice is broken and you can't ever refreeze it. Now, whatever happens next is just filling in the details. Instead of saying, oh, we have to satisfy all these conditions, and as they have said, as really as Obama and and Bush before Trump have said, and Trump has said this too, that basically until he announced this upcoming deal, he has said, you have to agree to all of our conditions before we'll even meet with you in that Dick exactly. Cheney style. And that, you know, that's basically been the policy all along. And so then this is the opposite of that. Never mind the details. We'll work those out later. But at least for now, let's go ahead and ratchet everything down by about six points, right? And that's the real goal of this thing. Well, I'll go you one better because – 
Nixon going to China, the initial very public visits, were in fact a largely symbolic ceremonial event. This was the, the take pretty pictures, people shaking hands, toasting one another, Nixon walking on the Great Wall. These were all designed to signal to the world that the U.S. and China were going to find a way forward. I think that the concessions that Kim Jong-un has unilaterally announced over the last couple of weeks yeah. about moratorium on nuclear testing, about opening up relations with the South, about finding a way for a peace treaty, all this stuff, I think that Kim is trying to leapfrog that first step and land in, in, in the second step, yeah. if you will, where it's like, okay, look, the ceremonial stuff, I don't have time for that. Let's just put that on the table and say it's done. Let's jump ahead to the next step, which is to begin to figure out how we can bring North Korea into the world system. In other words, uh, the Nixon Mao moment already happened, but it was moon. It was before it the was, Trump exactly. visit. Yes, it was before the Trump visit. It was a side Donald Trump. And this is why I say, again, his, his most important thing here is not to get in the way. Right. Um, and so I think we're a step past the, the Nixon goes to China thing. Yeah, great, the other man. point I, oh, the other point I want I want to share uh, about this and you, 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 you joked about it earlier um, about uh, Dennis Rodman that I, I think you said I would be the Dennis Rodman of this. No, uh, this I really mean that. that. I gave a speech back um, in 2013 where I did a whole thing about how, yeah, no, send Dennis Rodman and every one of his friends that he can bring and anybody else that the North Koreans want to invite. And he, yeah. you know, send the, you know what you do? You send the Globetrotters and the generals and you have, a, <laughs> you know, a party. <laughs> well, let me, let me, send let me. Send the Wu-Tang me, Clan. The Wu-Tang Clan. Let me, uh, let me talk about Dennis Rodman for a second, because, again, the Western media ha has, a, has, a, has a set narrative. Dennis Rodman is a circus clown. And when he goes to North Korea, it's the Dennis Rodman circus clown meeting with Kim Jong-un, the circus clown. And we've seen that uh, narrative taken to its extreme in that horrible Seth Rogen, James Franco movie, uh, The Interview, um, where they go to North Korea and they party and, and, and uh, Kim Jong-un is portrayed as a goofy playboy who just needs a friend. Kim was educated in, in Switzerland, where the little we know about it suggests that he was, uh, in a, he was in a private school undercover. He was there supposedly as the son of a, of a Korean diplomat stationed in Switzerland. Um, but he interacted with the kids, with the other kids normally. Um, it suggests that he probably speaks either English or French well, um, having gotten through that school. He, we know that using fake passports, he and some of his family members have done a lot of travel uh, around the world. Um, we know that his his uh, half brother, who unfortunately got uh, executed in Indonesia or in Malaysia, um, was a frequent visitor to Japan on a Dominican passport of all things. Um, we know that Kim consumes American and Western media, that he has some very close uh, cultural ties to Japan. When his personal chef for a long time was was Japanese, this is not a guy who's lived his whole life under a rock. This is not a guy who is unfamiliar with what is going on in, in the world, who is unfamiliar with the benefits of steps toward capitalism. He is not someone who is going to be surprised to find out you know, that, that uh, you, know, you, you don't have to sharpen pencils with a penknife anymore. You know, we've got electric pencil sharpeners. Yeah, but dude. you know what, though? Madeleine mm -hmm. Albright and, for that mm -hmm. matter, the whole, all the camera crews and all the people, yeah. all the reaction in America, they were absolutely stunned when she went there and they did the big celebration and yep. showed that, you know, they had their, uh, you know, their synchronized whatever the hell in the yep. auditorium with all the colors and pretty things. Yep. And and it was like, oh, wow, you're not all a bunch of cannibal cavemen, blah, blah, blah. It blew their mind to well, see for, that, oh, I get it. You guys are humans. You're just from somewhere else. Oh, yeah. I, I, well, that, that, yeah, that, that's so important. I, but, I think that kind of thing, you can't really underestimate how important that is that because yep. everybody's so propagandized. And I, believe me, I get you on the whole Seth Rogen crap. You but, know, Tim Shorrock destroyed that guy in a great piece on that movie. 
movie. More, more um, important, but, more importantly, though, Kim is is not just not a a a, a cannibal. He, I mean, but he is someone who. I guess I think the Americans are the ones who need to be propagandized yes, more yes, than the North I, I Koreans. We, but that's why to send Dennis Rodman still is the, so that he can come back and go look. Hey, they're just people. That's what he said, right? He came back and it was like, hey, that's probably the best thing that we could have going on for us is in terms of changing minds of Americans. There's people over there. It's cool. Calm down. Don't kill them. My point is, is that when you go to, if you sit down with Kim and you start talking to him about possible economic cooperation and, and what we, we would call steps towards capitalism, you're not talking to a guy who needs to be educated on this. He knows what this is. He's seen it. He's lived in it. And he understands the advantages and disadvantages of it. He, he is not a stupid person who, who is, is coming out from under a, a rock to see the brave new world. And that's very, very important because his father and, and his grandfather were not those kind of people. They were not worldly people in any sense. His, great, uh, his grandfather um, may or may not have been fully literate. Um, and these, he's not that person. He has an edu- a Western education. Um, and, and that's another thing that's going on here that, that suggests he may be the person. Do this for me, everybody out there, a little thought experiment. Take your image of Kim Jong-un, the madman, the crazy guy, the, the, the star of the interview, whatever, um, and replace that with a guy whose family has run North Korea for 70 years, who sees himself as a nationalist. Who sees himself? Who looks around his country and sees that people are hungry, that they're not progressing the way that he feels they should. He knows there's there's something out there, and he thinks he might be the guy to change all that. That rather than simply a caretaker of the slow degradation of North Korea, he's the guy that's going to make the difference. He's the Deng Xiaoping. He's the Gorbachev. He's the guy that's going to turn this around and his moment is coming. If you put that mindset on Pyongyang, this whole, cha- this whole thing changes. Yeah. Well, it becomes know, an opportunity, not something to fear. Look, there's a lot of Trump derangement syndrome going around, but what about uh, all the think tanks uh, are all financed by the arms manufacturers. And what about the, uh, well, look at who advertises on the, and they're not even shy about it, who advertises on the cable news, uh, you know, Boeing and, and Northrop Grumman and all these guys. And so uh, maybe the reason that they're so uh, determined to try to ruin this thing is because they want to sell ridiculous literal combat ships and mm-hmm. uh, aircraft carriers and pretend that there's some kind of threat in the Pacific. In fact, uh, they like to pretend there's a threat in order to cow the South Koreans and the Japanese into staying within America's sphere of influence. And maybe they're not willing to let this hopeful young dictator bring the peace that you say he, you think he uh, wants to bring. I'm going to be both practical and cynical enough to say that America has wasted enough money on defense over the last decades that we will continue to do so regardless of what happens uh, in yeah, North that's Korea. that's a good point. And, you know, if we you know don't what? build... The asteroids, we got to have build an asteroid defense. You're thinking, you're thinking like they think, Scott. I mean, that's it. If, if it's fine, okay, fine. If we're not building the weapons for the North Koreans, we're building them against the, uh, the eventual rise of, of uh, fill in whatever blank you want. It doesn't matter because it's all anyway. So it, it doesn't matter if we make, if we come to some terms with North Korea, fine. Yeah, we'll but just do build they missiles. agree with you? Are they willing to take that bet? Or they just they, they really need to keep some sort of pseudo conflict here. And well, it's always helpful to them to 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 uh, to have more bad guys than fewer bad guys. But I think at the end of the day, they're dollars and cents people. And as long as the contracts keep rolling in, whether the missiles sit in a warehouse in Nevada or are deployed on the front lines of the DMZ in Korea, it doesn't make a difference to them one hoot as long as the checks clear from Uncle Sam. So I am, like I said, practical and cynical enough that the arms manufacturers will find a way through this. Um, they, they did it with Vietnam for us. Uh, they, they're doing it with Iraq, more or less, for us. Um, they'll find a way to keep making money and keep producing weapons, even if, like I said, they just get piled up in a warehouse someplace. Um, I'm, I'm very confident uh, they'll see their way through this. 
All right, guys, here's who supports this show. The War State by Mike Swanson, the great Mike Swanson. He'll give you great investment advice, too, at WallStreetWindow.com. Uh, his book, The War State, is about the rise of the military-industrial complex after World War II in the uh, Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy administrations. You'll learn a hell of a lot. It's really great. And again, WallStreetWindow.com to find out uh, what he thinks you need to do with your money in these volatile times. And I'm sure some of what he'll tell you is you got to have at least some percentage of your savings in precious metals. And uh, when you go to get your precious metals, you go to Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. That's rrbi.co, rrbi.co. And uh, if you buy with Bitcoin, they take no premium at all. Of course, then there's Zencash, zensystem.io to read all about how it works. It's a brand new digital currency. It's uh, also a format for sending encrypted messages and documents and uh, has all kinds of great things going for it. I know digital cash people who really think it's great. Zencash at zensystem.io. And Hussein Badakhchani is back. He wrote this great book, No Dev, No Ops, No IT. And it's about how to run your technology business like a libertarian. No Dev, No Ops, No IT by Hussein Badakhchani. And... Uh, expanddesigns.com you want a brand new website 2018 model looks good for everybody for looking at you go to expanddesigns.com slash scott and you save 500 bucks all right now listen so the interview that i didn't run because we're speculating about what's going to happen <laughs> in syria and then it happened a couple hours later let's uh can we wrap up and talk uh, just a bit sure. about syria Absol so, absolutely so they didn't change the policy back to regime change but they did bomb the Syrian government, uh, based on this uh, supposed alleged chemical weapons incident in Douma. So tell me everything you think about it. Well, what I would want to throw back to you is please tell me everything that has changed since uh, the United States bombed Syria last week or whenever it was, 10 days ago. Well, no, short I answer mean, is I think the worst pro Israel hawks in D.C. were placated a little bit. <laughs> that may be it. Yeah, that's about it. Basically, nothing really changed. It was status quo. And and that's the most important thing here. Um, the interview we did, we went on and on and on about speculating what's going to happen. But at the end of the day, look, Trump just caved in to all of his uh, neocon advisors, um, his new guy, Bolton, and every John Bolton, every, who said, you got to blow something up, you got to blow something up, got to blow something up. And Trump said, fine, to hell with it, blow something up, you know. You guys pick some targets, blow something up, don't hit any Russians, don't hit any Iranians. Um, we only can begin to speculate. But, of course, there was, an, I'm sure, a massive amount of behind-the-scenes deconflictation with the Russians and the Iranians about, hey, would be a bad day for any Russians to be hanging around over here on, say, Thursday or Friday, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, Which is what had, you predicted in, in that... Yep. Uh, Friday, I mean, it was Friday before last now, right? We had, when I was in Iraq, um, we were at the end when uh, we were, the Americans were, we were packing up and trying to get out. And the uh, bad guys of all flavors were wanting us to pack up and, and get out. Nobody wanted a problem at that point. Nobody wanted some Americans to get killed, which means we'd have to retaliate, which means they'd have to retaliate. And occasionally one of our translators would say things like, Hey, I heard uh, Thursday's a bad day to go over to Salman Park. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll go someplace else on Thursday. And I'm certain that that process took place uh, with, with these strikes into Syria. Um, the, nobody wants to kill Iranians and Russians and make this a bigger mess. This was a, this was a pure – I'm sorry to say everybody who died in Syria under those missile strikes died for U.S. domestic political reasons. Yeah. All right. Well, sorry, so dudes. We still got major problems there, right, because, uh, well, they're saying they're not leaving until ISIS is defeated, but – it's actually ISIS is apparently being protected by the Americans, according to the map. <laughs> They're being uh, the Americans are between the last Islamic State readouts and the Syrian Arab Army, which is trying to get to them in these yeah. deconfliction zones. And then at the same time, um, 
they got themselves a conflict with the Turks, who have yep. already invaded and taken Afrin and are nose to nose with their American allies in Mambidge. And the Americans, you know, apparently over the president's wishes, <laughs> the Americans <laughs> are staying and are solidifying yep. their presence in eastern Syria, embedded with the Syrian Kurds there that the Turks consider their mortal enemies. So now what there? I think it's impossible in, in any realistic near term, and, and by that I, I certainly mean the, the first Trump term um, and probably well into whoever succeeds the first Trump term, whether it's Trump or, or, or somebody else. Um, it's impossible for the United States to disengage from Syria. It is too messy, too complicated. There are too many issues there. Domestically, politically, it would be a disaster because Disengaging from Syria means that whatever happens next will be blamed on the U.S. disengaging. Um, you've got, in, in, uh, and, uh, this list may not be complete, but basically at war, you've got the Syrian government, you've got the Israeli government, you've got the Iranian government, the Iranian special forces and revolutionary guard, the Hez Hezbollah, whatever Al-Qaeda has splintered off into, you've got all the varieties of ISIS, you've got the Turks, you've got various forms of, of Kurds, the Iraqis did airstrikes recently. Did I say the Turks? The Turks are there. The list goes on and on and on. The, the fact that the, the idea of the U.S. not being in in the middle of all that, um, given our, our, our long history of meddling in the Middle East, is impossible to imagine uh, at, at this point. It's simply too many people, too complicated for the U.S. to walk away and, and, and any president of the United States to be re take the responsibility for anything that happens after we leave, uh, quote unquote, because we left. Well, but if they're going to do any more airstrikes, they need to drop Obama and Brennan. Uh, well, that would be it, like, like at the very end of Dr. Strangelove. Yeah, but, uh, so, where, you no, know, but you're not really saying that's what you think. You're just saying politically speaking and this and that kind of thing because, of course— uh, I'm right? trying to right. predict what's going to happen. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. If, if, if I, I mean, was the thing charge, of it is, sorry. well, <laughs> I mean, well, two things. First of all, uh, two questions. Do you think that there's any way that the Americans could use their position embedded there with the Syrian Kurds to somehow, if they— really tried in good faith to negotiate a peaceful resolution to this thing and work something out? I mean, assuming you what could get thing? the Israel lobby to shut up for 15 minutes and get what them to thing? cut a deal with Iran and Russia, something like that? What thing? What are you trying to peacefully resolve? Like well, conflict in Syria? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm, no, 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 of course not. I'm no, saying, no, well, I mean, because you're saying anything violent that happens there after we leave will be America's fault. So then, OK, one well, solution to that would be to negotiate some kind of peace yeah. and then leave, you know. No, uh, no, this is this is going to be uh, and uh, this is going to either one. I, I long term, I think what you're going to see in, in Syria is going to be one of two things, either uh, an Afghan like situation where the various powers and big powers that are involved apply just enough pressure and force to keep the game going. Yeah. Nobody wants to win. Nobody wants to lose or nobody can afford to win. Nobody can afford to lose. So they just keep ramping it up and pulling it back down to keep it at a steady burn. Like you see in Afghanistan, that's how it's or, been. or some kind of evolutionary process as we saw in Iraq where through no intent or, fa or fault of anyone, it just kind of, evolves into something. In Iraq, uh, the way that ISIS ended up being defeated in Iraq was hardly anything that was planned or anticipated, basically a combination of American and Iranian forces. Um, nobody planned that one. Um, it just Same kind as of ever. <laughs> it, just kind did. Of, <laughs> it just kind of evolved. And at some point, I think the United States has said to itself, well, could have been better, but could have been worse. And that's where that, hey, I mean, I, I claim to have written my last article on Iraq uh, a couple about two months ago yeah, where I right. summed this all. I don't think I've got much more to say there. So I think that's, those are the possibilities. If I had to, had to pick one today, I'd go with the Afghan model where everybody's just going to basically keep this on simmer um, because there's no way to win it and there's no one wants to lose it. Um, the Israelis will keep dipping at the at the edges on their territory. The Iranians uh, have great, uh, you know, need that outlet to the sea. And this is just as easy as, as claiming territory. Uh, the Russians want their base bases in the Middle East. Everybody's getting what they want, more or less. <laughs> Except ending. the civilians, they're just getting exploded to death. Well, um, unfortunately, as it always is in, in, in war, um, these folks are just trapped in the middle of the shit and... There's nothing uh, going to help them. 
and that's the case. You can pick any war you want, right back to uh, you know the 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 the, the Greeks uh, fighting. I mean, it's sorry guys, you're just where we're all fighting. Yeah, you know what? Here's the thing, though, just uh, hypothetically and counterfactually and all that. It seems like to me that they absolutely could negotiate in good faith, and they could work out a deal where the Syrian Kurds are still part of Syria, but they have more autonomy than before, but they have a real handshake and a peace deal with the government in Damascus, where the American CIA stops backing al-Qaeda and, and forces all of our allies, including the Turks, to stop backing al-Qaeda in the Idlib province once and for all and let the Syrian Arab army finish that fight. And then go ahead and get out of the way in these no-confliction zones and let the Syrian Arab army finish ISIS there. And then, basically, what? Hezbollah and Iran don't have anything left to stay for at that point, um, not in much more strength than they were before the war. Mm -hmm. And so, then the last place America's embedded, the only place the Americans are really embedded, is with the Kurds, who, if the Kurds have a real deal with Damascus, they don't really have a quote reason to stay there maybe you know they want an excuse to stay but after all that's causing this major tension and conflict with the turks so i mean i know that it's a big complicated battlefield with all those groups that you listed but i think i listed them too and how like yeah isn't there actually a piece that's possible here if the americans were trying yeah i i guess maybe the answer to that would be I don't know who on the American side really cares enough to, to, to make those kind of efforts. There's, there's not really a whole lot of political capital that would come out of that. Um, you're, you're not it's, it's like Iraq. You're never going to get any more to the point where someone can stand up and declare uh, mission accomplished. Peace uh, is at hand. This isn't going to these wars are so amorphous um, and the goals of these wars are so hard to pin down that you don't end up with a, you know, victory in Europe day or, or you know, or, or the headlines, you know, we beat the Japs and everybody goes out to Times Square and, and, and kisses each other. These aren't those kind of wars. The, these are wars that no one really even knows why they're being fought, really. Yeah. Um, but you know what, though? Mm. The, the Bush Obama Maliki kind of uh, confluence there led to the Americans getting out of Iraq. And despite all the hype, of course, as you know, it was uh, American support for the al-Qaeda and ISIS fighters in Syria that led to the rise of the Islamic State in western Iraq. Not even Maliki's cold shoulder could turn western Iraq into the Islamic State. It took right, Obama's right. support for their enemies outright in Syria to, to blow yeah, back into but, but Iraq that, that way. that was planned. That just all kind of happened through Yeah, no, it was really lucky, and, right? The tribal forces among the Sunnis marginalized the al-Qaeda guys, and the, the Shia victory for Baghdad was pretty much complete, right. and so good place to call it quits. But so that's really what I'm talking about, too. You could more or less achieve good place to call it quits in Syria, and for that matter, yeah. in Afghanistan. Never yeah. mind bringing the Taliban into Kabul. Just you guys keep Pashtunistan and we'll have like very strong well, federalism and leave you alone and then well, stop yeah, fighting. Af right? Afghanistan is a possibility. But Syria and the problem the thing is in Iraq, the only one who had to decide it's good enough is the United States. Um, and, and we did. And we packed up and, and left. And we can do that in Afghanistan in some form. The thing in Syria is there's just too many players on the field. The U.S. can pack up and leave, but that doesn't mean everybody else is going to. And getting yeah, but coming to some at kind that of point. I mean, if the Americans well, got off the field and insisted that the Turks and the Israelis and and the Saudis back off, and that Obama's yeah. policy of regime change when, when, there is finally over, when 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 do the Israelis listen to us? I mean, come on. Well, I don't know if it's a yeah. <laughs> They're, they're going to be full time. And and this is where hey, I, look, I, I don't. I'm not under any illusion that Donald Trump is Ron Paul. I'm just saying how it could be. <laughs> I mean, you who's heard the superpower here? Yeah. You know, in fact, Ron Paul, I think, told us, I think it was Ron Paul that told the story of um, where Ronald Reagan actually at one point called the Israelis and told them to stop bombing Beirut, and they stopped in 15 minutes. And Reagan said, I can do that? <laughs> oh, my God. Wow, neat. <laughs> I got to try that again sometime. It can be done in the short term. Um Friends uh, will want to go back and take a look, for example, in 2006 when the Israelis were, uh, were bombing Beirut um, by accident, I guess. Um, just 
the uh, the uh, the time that the United States announced that it had secured uh, ferry service for Americans that were being evacuated out of Beirut to uh, to Cyprus, the Israelis paused their bombing and their missile campaign against mm -hmm. Beirut for an entire afternoon just by coincidence. Yeah. So I mean, these things can happen, but in the long term, no, they can't. And uh, I'll leave. I'll end with kind of a teaser. You know, this is how you do it on like reality TV. What will happen next? Um, the Israelis are going to be licking their chops uh, in a couple of weeks uh, when I believe Trump will no longer renew the, the uh, sanctions waivers against Iran and the Iran nuclear accord will become uh, a joke of history. And I think uh, at that point, the Israelis are going to have way more bigger fish to go after uh, stoking war with Iran than they're going to have to worry about in, in picking at the edges of Syria. Oh, well, so we got that going for us. And we've got that going for us for our next chat together Scott. poor jelani is going to be so upset all right yeah. hey listen thanks very much for your time again it's a great pleasure i always enjoy talking with you take care scott all right you guys that's peter van buren he used to work at the state department he knows uh, all about korea because he was stationed there for a long time so they call it stationed in the state department are you stationed over there when you're in the state department or is it called something else assigned assigned, assigned. he was assigned over there all right thanks again uh, yeah, he knows all about that, and good on lots of things, of course, uh, stationed in uh, Iraq, assigned in Iraq, in Iraq War II, and uh, wrote We Meant Well, that's also the name of his blog, and his latest book is called Hooper's War, and uh, again, find all he writes there, We Meant Well, and almost all of it, at antiwar.com, and I'm at scotthorton.org, youtube.com slash scotthortonshow, fools.aaron.us, for the book and the audio book, Fool's Air and Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and uh, antiwar.com, libertarianinstitute.org, and follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. Thanks.